Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Chatting with NDGS Paleo. Uh, my name is Becky Barnes. I'm a paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. We have with us today a guest speaker who was actually a co-worker for a while. She helped clean our dinosaur mummy, Dakota the Dino Mummy, worked for countless hours on <laughs> scale preparation, <laughs> along with the rest of us. So it was fun. <laughs> Fun, time-consuming, listen to a lot of audiobooks. <laughs> so I'm going to hand this off to, to Maren Bingle Davis, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, the Deccan Traps in India, so big volcanoes, and maybe some snails or mollusks. Okay, let me share this. Okay, so um, I did my PhD work in the Deccan Traps of India, focusing on freshwater mollusks, well, continental mollusks, there were some terrestrial guys in there too. But um, I wanted to kind of make this presentation a little bit more general, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the geologic history of India as it was separating from the rest of uh, Gondwana and go up through the Deccan Traps, and then a little bit of post-Deccan as well. Um, but the image you're seeing on the screen right now is the Temple of Koteshwar. It's a temple to Shiva, and it's right on the Arabian Sea. It was one of the things we got to do when we were done looking for fossils, and it was definitely worthwhile. Everything's made out of marble. It was entirely beautiful. And so I do have some fun pictures of India in here, aside from the geology. So this is a generalized geologic map of India and then a generalized stratigraphic column of India that I put together. And what we're gonna talk about today is in the red box. And so if you look at the map, the majority of that green stuff is all basalt in, in things that are associated with the basalt of the Deccan Traps. So you can see it's a pretty big area of India. So we're gonna start in the Triassic, and well, a little bit of Permo-Triassic there, but this is, what we call the Gondwana supergroup, and it's a big collection of beds that are all when India was still connected to Gondwana, as you can see in these paleogeographic maps. Um, one of the big things about Gondwana strata is that it's famous for its plant fossils. It does have some other things, but plants is what you usually find. Um, also, uh, one of the members of the supergroup is the Comte formation, which is one of the formations that underlies the Deccan sequence where I was working. But uh, most of it is a lot of uh, yellow and green sandstones, some shales and siltstones. And then you can see in that um, image I found, those are some of the floral types that you can find <coughs> in the Gondwan and supergroup. Moving on in the Jurassic. So this is the upper part of what they call the Gondwan and supergroup. And this is where Pangaea actually breaks up into two big chunks. So, India sticks with Antarctica and Australia, and then Africa and um, South America break apart. And during this time, there was some uh, hot spots happening, some um, vulcan volcanism. And so the Deccan traps are the most famous traps in India, but they are not the only ones. We actually have the Rajmahal traps, which are in eastern India, and those are upper Jurassic to early Cretaceous. And they're similar to the Deccan in mineralogy and also similar to the Deccan where it's a series of flows and then you have beds in between that have fossils in them. In fact, that picture of that, um, uh, I think it's a fern, I'm not sure, um, but that was found in one of the inner traps and um, Bir Bolsani, he's a very famous paleobotanist, decided that this area was worthwhile and created uh, India's first fossil park. And then that little dinosaur, I just put him in there for fun. He's a Jurassic aged uh, sauropod, uh, Arapasaurus, I believe. So now we're moving into the early Cretaceous and now India is fully isolated from the major um, landforms and it's starting its own biogeographic evolution. So this is when India really starts to have its, you know, special fauna and flora. Um, the early Cretaceous is kind of void of fossils for the most part. There's not a ton, but you do have uh, some dinosaur eggs. And actually, India is really famous for its dinosaur eggs. There's lots of them. And the two pictures I have here are not from the early Cretaceous because I couldn't find any pictures, but this is basically what they look like. The one on top is from Lametta beds. Um, I just pulled from a paper. And then the one on bottom is one I actually took 
um, and also from Lametta beds, which I'll talk about later. And so these are late Cretaceous dinosaur eggs, but we do have some from the early Cretaceous. Um, and also, as I said before, the Raj Mahal volcanism is still going on, and there's actually evidence of ash. And so some evidence that this time was actually a little more explosive than when the Deccan um, erupted. So we're moving into the middle and late Cretaceous, and this is when India starts to break away from the Seychelles and Madagascar. And this is when um, the hot spots in that area started to create the Deccan flood basalts. Generally speaking, we believe it's associated with the Reunion hotspot, but it's, there's a lot of controversy as to exactly what was going on. And also, this is when India was moving extremely fast across the Indian Ocean up towards Asia. Um, some estimates put it at 18 to 19 and a half centimeters per year, which, you know, if you're familiar with tectonics, right now the plates are moving at about four and a half centimeters per year. So you can see that India was really cruising, which explains why the Himalayas are enormous. So this is what paleogeographic representation of India looked like at about 65 million years ago. So when uh, the Deccan was erupting, when the dinosaurs were roaming around. Um, so India is on its own by now. And around the circle is a, the approximation of where the Deccan traps are found now. And so the volcanism is associated with the breakup of India and the Seychelles, which is that little island chain that's to the west of India. And on the right, you can see my advisor, Joe Hartman, standing in front of one of the bigger flows we found in the Nagpur area of India. So you can see scale, Joe's about six feet or so tall. So some of these flows are pretty big. So now we're gonna talk about the Deccan Traps, which was my area of research. And again, I'm not a volcanologist, so mostly I was looking at the fossils, but yeah, I do have a little bit of, you know, talk of the basalt in here too. So the Deccan traps in general, they call them traps or ghats in, in uh, Hindi, which means step-like because the series of flows and the erosion in between makes it all appear like it's stepping towards the ocean. And so currently there's about a million and a half cubic kilometers of volume of basalt and about 500,000 square kilometers of area that uh, the Deccan covers, but estimates go up to 10 million of both, which would be enormous. And um, they range anywhere from 10 meters thick on the east side to 60 meters thick on the west side. So the western gods are always thicker than the eastern gods. And you can have up to 15 different flows in an area, and each one of these flows will be mineralogically um, unique to the flow above and below it. And that's how they did a lot of detailed mineralogy in this area to figure out which flows were which and what order they come in. So there's about six to eight million years of volcanism during the Deccan um, with the largest pulse right before the end of the Cretaceous, but this is highly debated. Some people don't believe that it went that long. Some people think it was only about 100 to 200,000 years of volcanism, so there's a lot of arguing going on. Um, I tend to believe that it's a little bit longer, especially if you look at how the fauna and flora were um, reacting to it. So the pictures on the bottom, um, the one on the left is me standing on a big basalt flow that was just next to a highway that we happened to stop at. Um, the one in the middle was one of our um, coworkers, Ritu Sharma, and she's standing in front of one of the intertrapian sequences. And the beds on the top, my mouse, these are actual traps, and this is the sediment in between. And then there's traps under here that you can't see. And then, so uh, this right picture is um, of columnar basalt that we found at one of our localities. And so here's just some pictures. Uh, most of these are from the Western Ghats because they're prettier than the Eastern Ghats. But you can see the basalt flows and in between uh, sediments. And uh, this was, I thought was interesting. This was an Islamic temple that they built in a trap. So all of this is basalt. And it was right on top of a trap hill. So basically like up here, they built the temple on top of basalt. So back in the 1800s, when they first started looking at the Deccan traps, they, they had some wild ideas of how they were formed. They basically thought that it was this giant lake that covered the entirety of India. And then these lava flows kind of interfingered in themselves into the existing sediments. And that's how you got the, you know, 
salts on sediment on the salts on sediment sequence. But now we believe that that's not how it happened and you actually have a sequence. So we have you know, a lake that forms in these pre-existing sediments. Sometimes it's Precambrian crystalline rocks that they form in. Sometimes it's that Gondwanan supergroup I talked about. Then you have a trap that comes, basically destroys everything and turns into a nice solid basalts. And then later you have a new lake that forms with new animals coming in and new plants coming in, and then it just repeats itself. So in the sequence, we call this trap one, intertrapian one, trap two, intertrapian two, and so on and so forth. Oh, and this picture down here is at one of our localities. We actually saw the beginning of the lake sequence. So it pinches out right here. This green sediment is the lake and it has an upper nodular basalt, which was flow three and a lower amygdaloidal basalt, which was flow two. And generally speaking, the intertrapian beds are kind of a greenish color and the infratrapian beds are the ones underneath that are reddish. And I think it has to do with oxidation versus reduction, but I'm not quite sure about that. So here's a generalized stratigraphic representation of what's going on. So we have those uh, crystalline rocks that you can find, sometimes Gondwanan strata, and then you have your infotrapian sediments, which is anything that happened prior to any volcanism whatsoever. So these would be the flora and fauna that are untouched by volcanism. And then you have your series of traps with your little lakes in between. These all would all be intertrapian beds. And then anything happening after the traps would be supertrapian. And then over here is um, a representation of what I saw in our localities. So we have all of these localities we visited were, were infratrapian or before the flows. These were intertrapian ones, intertrapian twos, intertrapian threes, and intertrapian fours. That's as far as we got. And here you're getting closer to the KT boundary. So here's kind of a, a fun, so this is how it happens. You have volcanism that destroys everything and creates havoc and then that ends and then you have a nice period where everything comes back and these little lakes will form in the basalt themselves. And this is just a picture, a modern picture I took on the side of the road. And so here's what it would might have looked like, you know, if you ignore the road and cars. So you have dinosaurs walking around on these basalts and you have these lakes where you have fish and little mollusks and you know, little reptiles and amphibians and even little mammals hanging out in, in these uh, in-between periods. And these in-between periods could be anywhere from tens of thousands of years to a couple hundred thousands of years, depending on what was going on. Some of the flows too could be really thick. And so, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of volcanism are, you know, thinner. So the two areas that I wanted to look at when I did my study were paleobiogeography, which you know, India was on its own for so long that this is a, a, you know, what a lot of people look into when they look into India. But I wanted to look at the mollusks, these guys right here. And I didn't really get to get very far with that because, you know, it's a, it's a thesis, it's beginning of work. But interestingly, most of the species in India have an African affinity. So there's different hypotheses as to how India progressed across the Indian Ocean. Some people think it just went close to Africa. Some people think there was a land bridge connecting the two. Some people think these animals were hopping on island arcs to get to India. But you really see most of the species have an African affinity, which I thought was really interesting and I wanted to explore more. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of mollusk species from Eastern Africa, so I don't have a lot to work with. The other thing is the KPG boundary, which is always a fun thing to study. And here we have the Deccan Traps, you know, which is a massive volcanism output and it had to have done something to the environment, but you also have, you know, the impact. So what was more important? Was it the impact? Was it the volcanoes? Was it a little bit of both? Was it one or the other? I, you know, I tend to believe it was a little bit of both, but um, this is an interesting site we found in the Western Ghats. There were all these, see this uh, yellowish color right here? This is all iridium. So the, there were all these iridium layers but there was multiple iridium layers, and this is a dinosaur bone sitting on top of the iridium. So is this the KPG boundary and we have dinosaurs on top? Is this iridium from something else? This site is still being studied and nobody really knows. So here again, this green is the Deccan traps themselves, the Deccan plateau, and all these little purple dots are all of the mollusk localities that have been reported in any paper ever. Um, 
And basically, I only looked at these in the Nagpur area, and then we went over into the Western Ghats to do some comparison. And so these are the plates that were done by a combination of Stephen Hislop. He did this paper in 1860. He was pretty much the first and only one to ever look at these fossils. Um, so that would be the um, black and white illustrations on the left. And then we went back to England and took pictures of all the type specimens, and that would be what is on the right. We put these together so you can see the, the comparison between the original um, illustrations and the actual specimens. And then here's the rest of them, including there's not very many um, clam fossils. It's mostly snails, which would be indicative of more of a lake environment as opposed to a river. But we do have a lot of other things in the Deccan traps, including ostracods, dinosaurs, reptiles, fish, other vertebrates. Um, so I just wanted to summarize some of our localities. So this is an infratrapian locality. So before anything happened, and as I said before, it's red. And so here is where we found all our fossils. And these are chickpeas. So basically I was pulling off chickpeas off these plants and eating them while I was looking for snails. Out of fun. And so this is the nodular basalt on top of the infratrapian sediments. And there's a close up of that. And then here's the Conti formation that I mentioned earlier, which would be Gondwana in an age and was underlying. And so here's some of the fossils we found. So a lot of, uh, Freshwater mollusks, there's a big physid, and these physids are enormous. They're like the size of your hand. And some viviparids, a limnaid, and then also from the site, I didn't find this, but I pulled this out of a paper that came from the site. It was a snake that was wrapped around dinosaur eggs. Thought it was pretty good. And here's some other fossils that you can find in these um, infratrapian sediments, sometimes called the lametta formation or lametta beds. Um, these are some fish teeth. This is actually from the mid 1800s and this copper light was from that same locality. And then here's some of the dinosaurs that come out of the Lometa beds. And then here is Rajasaurus, which was one of the, you know, indicative of India dinosaurs. And here's him right there. And he came out of Lometa beds as well. So now we've had the first flow and then we've had the basalt stop. And then now the sediments can come back. The lakes can come back. So this is Intertrapian 1. And this is our Tockley location. And we actually lucked out here. They were digging a new retaining wall. And we persuaded them to wait a couple of days so that we could check out the sediments before they filled it in with concrete. So we were able to get a fresh section. And I got the most beautiful fossils out of here. And again, here's Ritu standing in front of the section. You can see it's kind of greenish in color. And here's a close up of what it looks like. And actually, I don't know if you can see it, but all these little red. Uh, sediments in there that's actually little chert stringers and silica stringers and that's actually what the fossils are made out of. So here are the fossils I found. So here's all the different snails. There's an ostracod. Here's a caraphyte which is an algae and then here's some fish parts. And I don't know if any of you guys are fish specialists but I thought this was an otolith or a fish ear bone but again I'm not a fish person. So if anybody has any ideas of what this this guy might be, I think it's an otolith. But just for scale, here's the scale bar down here, and that is one millimeter. So all these little snails are about a millimeter long. It was a grueling experience to photograph and prepare millimeter long snails. But I got like 10,000 of them. So this was a really diverse uh, section. So now we're into uh, intertrapian two. So now we've had two different flows come through. And this is where we saw the columnar basalts. And this is what the sediments look like. And then here are some of the snails that came out of it. And here it had a, a more white color as opposed to that greenish color. But um, age wise, it's definitely intertrapian two. And then there's some ostracods. I didn't find any vertebrates in this section. And then there's a picture of me just digging in the dirt. And then finally, an intertrapian three locality. This is uh, the only outcrop we really found of that. It was a historical locality that was described by Hislop in 1860, and I think they uh, built over it. This is all I have left, or all we have of the specimens there. We do have some ostracods and some snails. But interestingly, the snails got bigger. And so I started to read about this thing called the Lilliput effect after a, a major mass extinction or a major trauma. Sometimes the, the animals and, and uh, flora will be dwarfed. 
And so that's what I think might have happened with those intertrapian one and two localities is they had so much trauma from the initial basalt flows that they shrank because they are adults. They are not uh, baby snails. They are definitely adult snails. But by intertrapian three, they start to recover. And also, interestingly, the diversity didn't really change much. So all these basalt flows coming through and destroying everything really didn't change the type of species we found, just the size. And then here's a little bit of post-Deccan stuff, because as I said before, the Deccan traps were still erupting into the Paleocene. And so that's one of the sections you find here in, in Jamili. And then these are, here are two of the fossils that were pulled out of a similar section in the Paleocene. And again, like the diversity doesn't change a ton, but it does seem to have been somewhat affected by the actual KPG boundary, but not the volcanism, which maybe would make it seem like it might have been more impact related than volcanism, but I don't know. The other interesting part about, you know, India's movement across the Indian Ocean was when it hit Asia. And there's a lot of debate on when it hit, but some of the reports for the earliest uh, connection would be about 58 million years and then made its final connection about 40 million years ago. But where did all of this material go that turned into the Himalayas? And they call that the freeboard of India and a lot of people are trying to figure out where those sediments went and try to figure out if we could find any fossils in there to help suggest more biogeographic affinities. And then here are just some fun pictures of India. So this is a fort that was in the town we stayed in, Nagpur. And here's a statue of Gandhi in that same city. And then in the Western Ghats, this is the city of Buj, which is almost in the Arabian Sea, almost in Pakistan. In fact, we are on the Pakistani border for much of our collecting. And uh, the Pakistani jets were constantly flying over us, buzzing the border to make sure the Indians weren't doing anything fishy. And then uh, it's fun in India because there's, you know, cows are sacred, so they're everywhere. They just walk around like stray cats. And you have to watch out when you're driving because the, they won't move out of the road. They just stand there. And then this guy is Hanumanji. We found him on the way to the Western Ghats. And here's some people for scale. And he's the, the monkey god. He's a helper to Lord Rama. And then just my little additive on the end, I mentioned we went to the um, London Museum to look at the type specimens. While we were there photographing our type specimens, the person we were in contact with said, you know, you got to see something. And I said, okay, what? She pulls open the drawer and it's Darwin's collection when he was on the Beagle. And so this is his handwriting. It was really fun to be able to touch Darwin's specimens. And it was funny on the outside of the drawer, it had double shrine status, two pictures of shrines that were hand drawn. So that was fun. And that's it. So I can take any questions or whatever you guys want to do. Well, that's really cool. Oh, I'm so jealous about the Darwin stuff. <laughs> I know. It was so cool. I was shaking when I was touching it. I'm like, oh my God, this is Darwin stuff. <laughs> oh, very, very cool. All right. So we've got some questions in the, in the Q&A box and I can just read through those and then, then we just kind of answer sure. us as we, we go through them. Uh, one of which is, uh, can you clarify what is the KPG boundary? Is it the same thing as the KT boundary? Oh, yes. And I actually, I think I slipped up and said KT boundary at some point. Basically, it's just a nomenclature issue. You know, it used to be called the tertiary. Now it's called the paleogene. So it went from KT boundary to KPG boundary. It's the same. It's just more confusion. I know. <laughs> yep, just adding to the confusion that we, you know, us geologists love to do. All right, with the, the shells, now a lot of the shells that we find like here in North Dakota, they're preserved with calcite or aragonite. Um, and you said your shells were preserved with the, the uh, uh, silicas and, or and the cherts. So are these stein curtains or did the shell material actually preserve? Um, for the most part, they are stein kerns. And actually, in Takli, where I was mentioning the red silica, the, the specimens are red because it is just the stein kern. So it's the internal cast of the, the snail. But there are a few cases where we have, um, I, I shouldn't say original shell material because it's been replaced, but we have actual shell material and we can see the external surface. And we actually see some sculpture and some coloring on some of these something called a keel, which is like a line that goes around the edge of a snail. And we actually do see them on some, but it's rare. 
Very cool. Uh, so then uh, we have just another clarification in here as far as yeah, how did the snails survive the volcanic eruptions? Well, more than likely they didn't actually survive, but um, you know how it is in, yeah, <laughs> in modern times, you know, things come back in. So, you, you know, you have birds coming in with these little snails attached to their feet and, or, or a bird brings in a fish with little snails or clams attached to the fish or, or plants, you know, somehow they were brought back in once things started to return to normal. But I do find it interesting that you really didn't see a change in diversity, according, you know, because of the volcanism. Or at least I didn't see a change in diversity. Some of the other people who look at other things have seen a big change in diversity, like, um, oh, now I can't remember who that was. But um, the marine fauna does show a change in diversity during the course of the Deccan sequence. But, and so she was really interested in what I was doing. And I'm like, I'm sorry, they just... They're not dying, <laughs> they're not going away. But I do like that they were shrunk and I stand by my Lilliput effect. I think it's interesting because these were all adults and they were all super tiny. It's a lot of stress. <laughs> I just yes. lose my hair, you know, shrink, well, yeah. whatever. I mean, you can't blame them. I mean, you have this um, enormous Deccan dec volcanism that's destroying everything, you know, like the Western half of India. It's got to be pretty stressful. Uh, how old can snails get? Is there a way to like tell how, like, I don't know what a lifespan of a snail is? No, it depends on what group you're looking at. Some live longer than others. And it's, it's kind of like with anything else, you know, the number of worlds, so the number of, of rotations is somewhat indicative of age, but it's not like a tree ring where you can count them and say, this guy is five years old. But it does like they, when they're babies, they only have like two worlds. So the initial world and then the bottom. And then as they become adults, they get more worlds. And then depending on what group you're looking at, you'll have more worlds. Some are highly spired, some aren't. And I don't really know if there's a way to look at a specimen and know how old it is exactly. Especially when a lot of these are broken. It just reminds me of the, the snail that I used to have in my fish tank and, and you know, started out itty bitty, went to the pet store and got a little baby snail and you know the thing got to be like that big. It was it was a decent sized snail. And yeah. I I can't remember how long it lived, but it was a very happy, content snail. Yeah, some of them live quite a while. As long as they're not, you know, messed with, you know, if mm -hmm. you add some volcanism to your lake, you're gonna be probably I did not gonna dump lava in my fish tank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, another interesting thing about snails is some of the different families can have like up to 10,000 babies at a time. And so your number of species or number of specimens can be extremely large depending on how the, good the preservation is. But I was looking not necessarily on the number of specimens, but the species themselves. Yeah, my, my one snail went from one to about 42 <laughs> and then I bottled them all up. I was, I was very entrepreneurial as a child. And so I bottled them up in, in like little juice bottles, the glass juice bottles. And, and I took them to school and so, sold them for a quarter apiece. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but I did get rid of all the snails. That worked. Uh, let's see here. Can you explain what an ostracod is for those that don't know? Sure. Um, an ostracod, they, they kind of look like little lima beans and they're, they have a shell or a test on the outside, but then they have like a, almost like a little crab on the inside. So it's actually an arthropod. And uh, so when you get the preservation of ostracods, you never really see that little guy inside. You just see the test on the outside. And that's what we see here. And they've all been replaced too. So like the ones at Tockley were red because the other specimens were red and, you know, likewise. But I saw a lot of them. Did you find any live snails in your journeys? We found modern ones, but not live. Just, you know, after the actual organism's gone, you just find the shell. So we found a couple of those. And uh, most of the modern Indian species are, are in the same families as the Deccan ones, but not the same species. That changed pretty dra dramatically. And like I said, it seems to be at the actual KPG boundary is when they changed and not before. But again, that's a lot more research that I haven't really done. <laughs> Do you have a favorite fossil that you found on your adventure? Ooh, 
Okay, so my advisor would probably want me to say it was a snail. And I did find some really fantastic snails. Um, I did find one of those physids that was almost the size of my hand. So that was kind of fun. But I'd have to say my favorite specimen I found was a chunk of a rib cage of a dinosaur at Pizdora. It wasn't, it wasn't the whole rib cage, it was just a chunk, but you could see three ribs. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Speaking of dinosaurs, do you have a favorite dinosaur? Ooh, I don't know. I've always been partial to Triceratops, you know, studying in North Dakota and then Wyoming, so. Yep. This is Misty. <laughs> but there are some interesting ones in the Indian subcontinent, though. They had, you know, they had their own little evolution going on. There's some, some cool stuff. Are baby snails born with shells? Yes, they always have a shell, but when they're first born, usually that shell is not like a normal adult shell. They're not, yeah, they're smaller and they're almost gelatinous. Is that a, that might be the right word for that. They're not, they're not like they are in, the, in adult form. And that's why when I was looking at those ones saying that they were all adults, that's how I was able to turn, not the gelatinous part of it, but the, you know, the, they had multiple worlds, even though they were a millimeter long. So they had to have been, you know, adults or at least on the way to adulthood, not babies. All right, so when the lakes return to the different areas on, on top of the traps, were the lakes freshwater or marine? And what would have been the source of water? Um, well, the ones that were in the area that I was researching are all freshwater. But that's an interesting point. I didn't actually get to go, but there are some Deccan localities near Rajamundri, which is in the very southeastern corner of the Deccan Plateau. And these are actually brackish and they have brackish fossils in them. Um, the source of the water, I mean, there's, there's rivers too. And I didn't really discuss the rivers because they're rare, but there was a river system that produced, um, there's some channel sands and there's some uh, sculptured bivalves, which are indicative of rivers. And they're, they're there, but the lakes preserve much more often. So we, we really get that lake fauna and not the river fauna in the Deccan. And that, I don't know why. Um, down in the southwest corner, um, we have a picture or a, a capturing of the KPG boundary. Uh, what is your opinion, having studied the Deccan traps, what is your opinion of the source of the iridium. Do you think that the iridium uh, that's coming out of the Deccan traps went global? Do you think uh, we're going to see some of it here? And just can you talk about the, the KT, KPG boundary and uh, maybe try and tie that into what we see here? Sure. Um, I do believe that the iridium in North Dakota came from extraterrestrial sources. I, I do believe that. And I think that maybe some of the iridium in India came from extraterrestrial sources. I think that would have been more of a global thing. And I think that the multiple iridium layers that we saw at Viri, which is the name of that site, I think that was actually from the volcanism. That's what a lot of people have hypothesized and because it's not as concentrated as the iridium anomaly we see like in North Dakota. Um, I, I really, you know, I'm kicking myself about this, but I took samples of the iridium and I wanted to do it or Put it in an XRD and I never got a chance to do it but I still have the samples so if anybody wants to do it I would really like to see what the counts are <laughs> and likewise I took samples from all of the intertrapians and um, the basalt I wanted to compare them mineralogically and I never got the opportunity but yeah I, I do believe that the iridium in India is not extraterrestrial at least the stuff that I saw well, thank you so much for, for taking time out of your busy day to, to come chat no with problem. us today. It was awesome. I like talking about India. It's fun. <laughs> Indian snails. It works. Yeah, I, I put dinosaurs in there. You too. Did. Don't... You did. I do. The Rajasaurus is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I forgot to mention that it seems, and you know, don't quote me on this, but it seems like the diversity of dinosaurs is much better in those infratrapian beds than in any of the intertrapian segments. I mean, I didn't see any dinosaur fossils in any of my intertrapian localities, but I did see it at the infratrapian. They just don't like lava. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, thank you again for, for chatting with us. Um, next week, I believe Clint is going to be kicking things off on Tuesday at uh, 10 a.m. Central. Yep, he's giving us a thumbs up. So he's going to be talking about a creature who's totally not better than Triceratops. <laughs> Thessalosaurus, the neglected lizard. Uh, so tune in for an awesome talk. He's got some some casts at home, so we'll have some show and tell pieces. And then on Thursday, we're having a guest speaker who's going to be chatting with us from Mexico City. So we're getting some some global stuff, which is really cool. All right. Well, thank you, and you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, guys. It was nice seeing you all.